Keep your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 22. If you need the notes this morning, please hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. You notice the flags are up. Our missions conference starts this coming Friday. We'll be talking about that at the end of the service. But I trust that you'll be here. I trust you'll begin to let God work on your heart about the missions conference already. Isaiah chapter 22. If you would, I'd like you to scratch both your ears right now. All right? You say, preacher, why is that? Well, the Bible says in the last days they'll have itching ears. I have got news for you. I don't think in Isaiah chapter 2 we'll find anything to scratch those ears. All right, if you know what I'm talking about, the Bible says people have those itching ears and they want their ears tickled. And so God's got some wonderful things for us, but it might be a challenge today as God speaks to us. So I'm glad we're in God's house. I hope you came to hear from God. Did you come to hear from God this morning? I hope that you did, not from me and not from somebody and just a Sunday school teacher, but from God. I hope you've come to learn. I hope you've come to be changed, to be instructed, to be challenged. Because that's what God's Word is about. We're living in a day and age where most folks come to church many times not looking to be changed, not looking to be altered, not looking to let God put His finger on things in their life, not looking for God to, to lift them up or change their life, just kind of tickle their ears a little bit and kind of pat them on the back and send them out. I'm glad we serve a righteous, holy, loving, compassionate, all-knowing God who wants to help us and strengthen us and help us in our walk. And we're going to see that this morning, preaching through the book of Isaiah. Now we come to Isaiah chapter 22, going chapter by chapter, verse section by section. And we're coming to this wonderful passage here. And it's been a challenge and a joy for me to study it. And we're looking at it this morning. It says, a burden, the burden of the valley of vision. If you look through several verses in there, that speaks about Jerusalem. The word burden in Isaiah, refers to judgment. It talks about correction. It talks about dealing with sin. It talks about making corrections in their lives. And so we're finding the correction, the judgment, on the valley of vision, which is, we see, the city of David, which is then, of course, Jerusalem. So it's a lesson for us this morning. So the message this morning is, Beware the burden of Jerusalem. We need to beware what God teaches teaches here. Now, God put that in there in the Old Testament and given it to us and preserved it for us so we can learn, so we can grow, so we can study, so we can have it applied to our lives today. How many believe this morning all the Bible applies to us? We just can't pick and choose. We don't understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. We don't understand the Old Testament fully until we've seen it reflected and fulfilled in the New Testament. So God here is teaching us by His preaching from Isaiah to the children of Israel, in particular Judah, but here we're looking at Jerusalem also, teaching us, encouraging us, helping us this morning. So it says, my title it says, Beware. Beware, if you will, the judgment on Jerusalem, because this is God dealing with his own people. This is not the enemy of God's people. This is God's people. This is not somebody that God is dealing with because he wants no part, because God doesn't deal that way. This is for his own people. In fact, this is of Jerusalem, his city. If you know your Bible, if you know about the future, you know about the millennial reign of Christ, after Christ comes, we have the rapture, seven years tribulation, then Jesus comes back with us at the battle of Armageddon and sets up his thousand year reign. He will be reigning and we will reign with him in the city of Jerusalem. So it's his city, it's his place, it's his place where he's going to reign. So God is now dealing with his city. He's dealing with his people. He's dealing with the folks that he's focused on and he loves and cares about. The people that he's used as a as a timetable, if you will, throughout all history and in the history yet to come. And so as he deals with his history, he deals with his city, he deals with his people, begins judging them, it's for us to understand that we as Christians are his people also. Amen? Are you out there this morning? Remember how this goes? If you want to get home for dinner, talk back a little bit. I knew that. All right. Somebody understands that. Which dinner? I'm not saying. But... So God is dealing with us. So we, as salvation, become the children of Abraham by faith. And so God is dealing with us. So we see in this passage is God dealing with Jerusalem, his people, his city, his beloved city. 
We can also see him dealing with us today, his people, and his church. So God, who never changes, deals with us, and he's preserved it in here for us to understand, for us to grow, and for us to be molded more into the image of Christ. So I'm asking this morning that as we look at Isaiah, preaching to the people there of Judah and Jerusalem, put yourself there. Listen to the prophet preaching. Listen to the prophet talking to them. And so we're going to find God helps us by showing what's wrong, how to live right. How what he judges so we know how to live so he doesn't have to judge so we can please him so he can bless us. So as we look at it, don't get all hot and bothered. Don't get all upset because we see judgment and justice and, and dealing with. But say, I'm glad God is telling me. God is warning me. God is helping me. God's letting me hear today how he feels about things so we can be on guard so we can have our lives in the right place, in the right position for God to bless and we can be a blessing to God. So put yourselves in Jerusalem, listen to him preach, listen to him speak as the man of God here, as Isaiah challenges and corrects. But again, it's hard for us sometimes to see the blessing in correction, to see the blessing in warning. I've told you so many times, and I just said it to my kids, tell some of our Christian school kids just this last week. Because we're kind of like teenagers. We don't want anybody to tell us where we're wrong. We don't want anybody to tell us where we need to change. We don't want anybody to tell us what needs to be adjusted. When my kids were growing up, as they would go off every day, I'd say, be good, work hard, and learn a lot. That was my instructions to them as they went off to school. Be good, work hard, and learn a lot. Carol, my wife, would say, well, tell them to have fun, too. I said, I don't have to tell them that. They'll figure that out on their own. I just need to make sure that they're going to be good, work hard, and learn a lot. And then she would throw in and have fun. So God here is trying to help us. So as we look at this, let's leave from this place saying, I want to be more what God wants me to be. I want to be more in line with what God desires. And God is instructing us on how to get things better in our life. I'm glad God wants us to have a better life. I'm glad God wants us to walk closer to Him. So looking at this passage this morning, beware the burden or the judgment of Jerusalem. So we look at it as a church and say, where am I sitting? I look at it as a Christian. How am I sitting? What's God trying to teach me as he's trying to teach them? So with that in mind, a very simple passage this morning, very simple message this morning, but it'll help us if we just tune our ears, tune our hearts to what God has to say. So very quickly this morning, notice first of all, the burden of a calloused people. The burden of a calloused people. God here is dealing with some people whose hearts are calloused. I mean, you just can't get to them. You just can't stir them. Like we used to say back home, you couldn't stir them up with a stick. It just couldn't do it. They just can't be stirred. They just can't seem to get their act right. They just can't seem to hear from God. So it's a callous people. And we'll see that in a moment. But I want you to notice, even as we look at God's judging of his people, we find, first of all, the burdened heart of the prophet. The burdened heart of the prophet. Now, when God says the burden of Jerusalem, that's judgment. What I'm talking about here, about the burden of the heart of the prophet, is the prophet's heart being burdened for the people. The prophet's heart being broken for the people. The prophet's heart, Isaiah's heart being being stirred for the fact that God is having to bring judgment. His heart being stirred because they're not right with God and they're not hearing from God. That he has a love for God, he has a love for the people, and the two aren't going together. And we find he has this great burden for the people that are away from God. By the way, the closer we are to God, the more compassion we should have for others. The more we are like Christ, the more we're going to have a compassion for others. Not just those that are nice to us. Not just those that are living good lives. But for all people, we should have a burden for them. Look at verse number 4. And now he's giving the prophecy. He's telling about the burden. He's telling about the judgment and about the enemy coming in. Verse number 2. Thou art full of stirs. A tumultuous city, a joy city. Thy slain men are not slain with sword, nor dead in battle. He says, you've got a bunch of dead folks, not because they went to battle, but because they've been killed by the enemy. All thy rulers are fled. He said, all your rulers, they're letting out of town. They're running, taking care of themselves. They are bound by archers. All that are found in thee are bound together. They have fled from thee. So the judgment's coming, the enemy's coming in, the Assyrians are about ready to destroy them. Therefore, said I, look away from me. 
This is the prophet. He says, don't look at me. Don't look at me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. For this is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and the crying to the mountains. He says, don't, don't, don't look at me. He says, I'm crying, I'm weeping, I'm heartbroken. He said, don't try to comfort me because there is no comfort, he says, in this situation. Because we are going to be destroyed. God is dealing with you as his people. And he's bringing this chastening. He's bringing this judgment, this burden to bring you back to him. He says, but he says, don't try to comfort me. He had such a burden for the people. Such a burden for the sins. Such a burden for the fact that God and His people were not united. God and His people weren't walking together. We need that kind of heart today. As God's people, we need that kind of burdened heart for the people around us. We need that kind of burdened heart for the lost around us. Sometimes we say, well, I'm too busy to tell somebody about the Lord. If our hearts are burdened, we'll want to tell somebody about the Lord. We get upset because sometimes there's, there's activities going on in the world. We say, how terrible can that be? How wretched those people are? How vile, how hurtful they are? And true, we ought not to justify sin. We ought not justify abuse. But our hearts ought to go out to a broken world. Our heart ought to go out to a world that's away from God. Our hearts ought to go out to a place and to a country that's quickly going away from God. How's our heart this morning? The prophet here, though he's been ridiculed, though he's been ignored, but he says, I look at what's coming. I look at the judgment I look at the problem he said my I'm just weeping and I cannot be comforted by the way Jesus has that kind of heart for his people a broken heart a burdened heart that's why in Matthew 23 37 Jesus here many years after the passage here looking at Jerusalem his city God's city God's chosen city the place where he's going to rule from and Jesus there where he was going to be crucified knowing he was going to be crucified there he stood and looked at the city and Jesus to the people that were reviling him who were going to crucify him Jesus said in Matthew 23 37 oh Jerusalem Jerusalem thou killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee he said you kill the prophets and those that have I sent to you, those that have I sent to tell you about our compassion, our love, and trying to get you right, and trying to teach you, you've stoned them. You've killed them with stones. Jesus says, How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And you would not. Jesus looking at that city, just like Isaiah looked at the city there speaking to Jerusalem, he says, I'm weeping because I see the judgment. I'm weeping because I see a people that's not want to get back to God. I'm weeping because I, because I see the people that have no heart for God and no desire to walk with God. And he says, don't try to comfort me. I'm weeping. Don't labor to do that. He said, because this is a day of trouble. And Jesus, as they looked at Jerusalem, knowing the end was coming, knowing his own crucifixion was going to be there, knowing what was going to happen to Jerusalem in about 70 years when they were taken over again, he said, I would like to just pull you in like a mother hen does her chicks and just protect you, just love on you, just overshadow you he said but you would not oh we need compassion on people that are away from God we need compassion on a lost and dying world I've said it so many times Ezekiel 33 Ezekiel 33 say unto them God says as I live saith the Lord of hosts I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked he said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The wicked that are on the way to hell. The wicked that have never received Jesus Christ. The wicked that are against God. He said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God's heart, God's compassion is a burden on his heart, just like our prophet Isaiah had a burden. He said that people would come to him, that people would repent and come to God, that people would come to God and be saved, that people would not have to go to a place called hell, people would not have to have eternity separated from God, but would come and repent to him. I'm glad we have a God who has a heart like that, who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather desires all to be saved and all to repent and all to come back and all God's people said amen that's the kind of God that we have as Jesus was moved with compassion and God has compassion
So ought we to have compassion. We need that burdened heart. As we look at the judgment coming on this world, as we think about the place called hell, as we think about all the things that sin brings upon us, we ought to have a burdened heart like the prophet for the people that need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in Psalm 126, 5, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, that is the word of God, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. See, preacher, I want to rejoice. The rejoicing comes after the tears. The rejoicing comes after the, 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 the weeping. But having tears for people that are hurting. Acts 20, 31. The Apostle Paul said, Watch, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. When's the last time? Are you, are you still with me, class? When's the last time we wept for people? And I'm not talking about your mother. I'm not talking about the passing of your grandma. I'm talking about people around us. I'm talking about people that are away from God. I'm talking about people that need to know the Word of God. People that need to know the compassion of God. People that are on their way to an eternity without Christ. When's the last time we wept for them? So as we look the burden of Jerusalem, beware. Make sure our hearts are tender. Make sure we have a burdened heart for the lost. A burdened heart for those that need Jesus Christ. A burdened heart for those that need to hear. We hold, we stand here this morning or sit here this morning. We have the Word of God. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're on your way to heaven. Amen. We're never going to go to hell. Hell has no control over us, no hand upon us. We've got the answer to the, what the world needs. We've got the answer. It's Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and faith in Him. How people can have a joyful life, a pleasant life, a holy life, a right life, a blessed life, a life that here that heads into a place called heaven. We've got the answer. They do not. It ought to be a burden to our heart as the prophet. So we find this burden of a callous people. The judgment on this callous people. We find, first of all, the burdened heart of the prophet. Boy, let's check our own hearts. Let's check our own hearts. When we see people walking down the street, do we ever wonder, I wonder if they're saved. I wonder if they know the Lord. I wonder if they have an interest in the things of God. I wonder if anybody ever told them how Jesus died on the cross for them. I wonder if they, or do we just kind of, well, that's just them and I'm about my own business. Let's get that burdened heart like the prophet. As we look at this burden, this judgment on Jerusalem, this judgment of a callous people, we find, secondly, the broken defenses of the people. The broken defenses of the people. So as we look at the people's situation, we see the broken defenses. Look at verse number 7. He begins to lay out the defenses. They, they had it all figured out. They were all set to defend themselves against the Assyrians. They were all set to defend themselves <coughs> against the judgment that was coming. Verse number 7, And it came to pass, and it shall come to pass, that the, <coughs> excuse me, the choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. He said, all right, he says, so the enemy's coming, the chariots are going to be there, the horsemen are going to set themselves against the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah. And thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. He said, you've got your armors all set up in the houses of the forest. You've got your armor all stored. You've seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many. He said, you've scoped out the city. You've seen where your holes are. And you're gathered together the waters of the lower pool. The waters of the lower pool is what Hezekiah had made. The waters inside those inner gates, between the inner and outer gates. So they would always have water when the enemy attacked. He said, so you've got your water there. He says, you've got your armor there that's ready. Verse number 10, And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses ye have broken down to fortify the wall. He says, So you found the holes in the wall. You've broken down the older houses and fortified the holes. you fixed the holes. He said, So you've got your, you've got your walls in place. You've got your water ready for the battle. You've, got your, you've brought in your armor from the, from the forest. Verse number 11, You also made a disc between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But... Ye have not looked unto the maker thereof. Neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. They had their defenses, but their defenses were broken because they did not look to God. 
They did not look to God. They did not trust in God, but they trusted their own efforts. They trusted their own works. And God says, he said, I, I see your wall. You're working on fixing your walls. Good job. You've got your water inside. Good job. You've brought in from the forest and the house of the forest your, your weapons. Good job. He says, you've torn down the old houses so you could build up. Good job. He says, but you've not looked to me. You've not looked to God. You've not looked to trust in God. Their weapons and their technology was in place and good, but they trusted in the weapons and the technology and their plans instead of God. You say, preacher, what's the status of the church today? What's the status of America today? We're trusting in our technology, our plans, our own will, our own strength, our own might, and not looking to God. If we get, if you get nothing else out of the message this morning, let's trust God. Let's trust God for the things ahead. Let's trust God in our lives. By the way, there's nothing wrong with making preparations. In fact, you're foolish. The Bible talks often about preparing, working ahead. I think you have the quote there. On a certain occasion, when Cromwell with his troops were about crossing a river to attack the enemy, he concluded his address in these terms, in these words. Put your trust in God. But mind you, keep your powder dry. Wise words. In other words, do what you do what God enables you to do. Do what you're supposed to do. Build where you're supposed to build. Plan like you're supposed to plan. Take the wisdom God has given you. Take the resources God has given to you. Do the things God would have you to do. Do all the things we can do. But when it's all said and done, depend upon God. Because, ladies and gentlemen, without God, all our defenses are nothing. Without God, all our hopes are nothing. Without God, all our endeavors are absolutely nothing. You say, preacher, I'm all set. I've got a great 401k. You say that and you probably don't even know what it means. I don't either. But it's real easy for a 401k to go down to 102 nothing. Because that 401k without God brings us nothing. You say, well, you, I, 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 got, I got all my medical. And I'm trusting in my medical. No, without God, that medical will not help you at all. I'm trusting in my job. Without God, you don't have that job. Without God, that company will not be solvent. I'm just saying we need to put our trust in God. By the way, I'm glad we can trust God. And here we find the burden. Here comes the judgment on His people. The judgment on Jerusalem. The judgment, if you will, on the church today. The judgment on America today. Because we've seen that America is modeled, if you will, after... Uh, the. The people there of, of Isaiah's time, used of God, blessed of God, but getting away from God. God wants us to trust Him, to trust Him. It says in Jeremiah 17, 5, Thus saith the Lord. Who says this class? The Lord. Cursed. That's not a good start. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh means his own flesh, his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Two verses down, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. So in Jeremiah 17, 5 and 7, it says, cursed if you trust in the flesh. Cursed if you trust in your own way. Cursed if you're trusting, trusting man. But blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. What a difference. I want to be blessed. You want to see, preacher, I want to be blessed. Then let's just trust God. Cursed is the man that trusts his own self. Cursed is the man that trusts his flesh. But blessed is the man that trusts the Lord. Here we find God bringing judgment on his people, his city, because they did not trust him. Their defenses were there, but their defenses were broken because they did not trust in God. The burden. No wonder the judgment of a callous people. Their defenses were broken because they didn't trust God. I'm asking you this morning, who are you trusting today? The Democrats? The Republicans? The Green Party? The Purple Party? Our God. Oh, I'm trusting my bank account. Let's trust God. I'm trusting my own strength. Trust God. I've got it all planned out. I've got it all mapped out. No, just trust God. So we find the broken defenses of the people. Let's just trust God. God warns them. God's chastening them so that we can take heed. Notice very quickly, as we look at the burden of a callous people, we find the barren consciences of the partiers. The barren consciences of the partiers. If you drift it out, come back. This is where we are today. 
Verse number 12. And in that day, Isaiah here is preaching. God's given him the words to speak to his city. And in that day, did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to the girding with sackcloth. So here God is saying, I need you to repent. I want you to repent. He says, you've walked away from me. You've left me. So therefore, you've gotten away and you've worshipped idols and you've got sin in the camp and you've got sin in your nation. He said, I want you to come back. And that's the whole idea of Isaiah. It's a revival book. God looking at his people and said, boy, I want you to come back. What do I need to do to get you to come back? Let me chasten you. Let me preach to you. Let me correct you so you can come back to me and we can, you can be my people and I can be your God and we can have that peace and joy again. He says, I'm calling you. He said, I've called you. Verse number 12, to weeping. In other words, repentance. He said, I've called you to look at your life and look at your situation and to weep and to mourning. I've often said it. We See, we live in such a society. We'll see, we're in the next couple of verses. Can you imagine us putting a sign outside that says, come weep with us? Come mourn with us? Crowds are just pouring, wouldn't they? Yeah. But that's what God says. God says, God called to weeping and to mourning and to baldness. Baldness is what the men would do. They would get under such burden or when they were had uh, sorrow, they would shave their heads. So he's calling them to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. In other words, putting on the sackcloth, which represented they were mourning, they were sad, they were repenting, they were turning to God. So God called them to repent. God called them to get right. Verse 13, here's their answer. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, and a drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts, surely this iniquity. What iniquity? God called them to repent, and they said, we're just going to party. We're going to party. We're not going to repent. We're not going to mourn. We're not going to get right. We're just going to party harder. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord of hosts. And so what we have is God calling them to repentance, and all they got answered back was, no, we're going to party. It was a party spirit, a party mentality. It was a party regardless of what God wants. It's a party regardless of what the situation is. It's just party, party, party. I don't know how, what it, I've heard people say, party hardy. I don't know what that means. Is that anything like Andy Hardy? Only people over 50, 60 years old know about Andy Hardy. All right, but... But see, judgment was coming. And what was their answer? Let's party. The burden was coming. Their answer? Let's party. God's calling us to repent. Let's party. God says, I want you to, to look at your own life. He says, I want to bless you. I want to call you back. You are my people. He said, I want you to understand how we're separated and so you come back to me. See, here's the problem. We want God to come down to our level. God wants us to come up to His. We expect God to come down and acknowledge our sin and say our sin is all right, as opposed to God saying, no, I want you to leave sin and come be with me. But he says, come with me. Judgment is coming. The war is coming. He said, I've seen. He said, you've got your armor in array. You've torn down houses and filled your walls up. You've got the water flowing around, so you're all set for battle. He says, now, he says, repent and come to me, God says, so I can protect you, so I can let you use those weapons. And all they could do was party. Preachers had come and preached. Repentance, but their answer was no, just party. I was looking at that and studying about that. By the way, there's nothing wrong with having fun. I thought I'd get an amen out of that. Look, nothing wrong with having fun. In fact, we are a fun, the mental church. I've heard people say, I've heard about fundamental churches. There's no fun and certainly nothing mental about them, that's for sure. But, Nothing wrong with having fun. But the idea here is they're going to say, they're ignoring what God says, and we're just going to party. We're living in a society that's just party. It's just pleasure. 
Again, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. The book talks about having pleasure with God and in God and God providing pleasure and the joy that we can have and the blessings we can have. Nothing wrong with that. And God wants that for our lives. But when we have a mentality, never mind about God, I just want my party. Never mind what God wants me to do. I just want a party. No, no matter what, I, how God wants us to live, I just want a party. We are in danger because that's what God said. Surely this iniquity. This response to God's word, saying, no, I don't want God's word. I want a party. I don't want God's instruction. I want to do it my way. He said he called it iniquity. Iniquity. So as I look at this, I begin thinking about our churches. Don't want worship. We want party. We don't want a minister. We want a party. We don't want to serve. We want a party. Again, God is revealing this to them, to reveal it to us, to know how we need to be and realize God's got something for us. God's word said repent. Their reply was party. They had no conscience. No conscience. There it was. He says mourn. Repent. Nah. Bring some more wine. Let's kill some more oxen. Let's get the music going. Let's, we're just going to party more. No conscience. We're living in a day and age where there's no conscience. No conscience. Are you still with me this morning? I'm just saying, don't get all burdened down except as the Lord would bring conviction. Say, Lord, I want to be right. I want a conscience toward God. I want a heart toward God. I want a spirit that hears from God and letting God work in my heart. I do not want to reject what God says for my own desires and my own pleasures. But we're living in a time where there's no conscience. I'm afraid in our churches, in our nation, there's no conscience. First Timothy 4, verse number 1. Now the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, such as we are now, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Man, you just can't get through the conscience of some people. We've got our conscience seared. Romans 1, 28. Even as they did not like to retain God of their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, talking about the, uh, the sodomite crowd, the homosexual crowd, to do those things which are not convenient. They just have no conscience. No conscience. God says, repent and mourn. They says, no, we're going to party hardy. We're just going to party more. It's like Israel when they crossed over the Red Sea. Moses went up to get the, the commandments of God. And you know what happened? He was gone for a little while. They said, we don't know what happened. And pretty soon they got the party attitude. Had Aaron make that calf, that golden calf. And the Bible says they rose up in the morning and they began to dance and they were naked before that camp. Just a wicked party thing. Just after a few days, they just had no conscience. I'm amazed today. I'm amazed today how we have no conscience. In other words, we just don't get pricked in our conscience. We just can't let God speak to us and change us. Well, since we're in Isaiah, I'll go ahead and preach it. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Hello? That's what it says. It says when you assemble together, don't forsake it. Don't pass it up. Don't go away. And people will say, Amen. Good. But tonight, I've got a dinner engagement. And Wednesday's my bowling league. And Friday and Saturday, the missions conference, you don't understand. That's, that's the only time I get to clean my house. You don't understand. That's the only time I get to do grocery shopping. That's the only time we get to relax. We put our feet up on Sunday night, and uh, or maybe Sunday morning, or maybe Wednesday, and we get our pizza, and we get our Cokes, and we put something on the television. That's our only time to... Hello. I'm amazed. The Bible says we're not to rob from Him yet. We spend it on our parties. The Bible talks about dress modestly and gender appropriate, but we don't, we're still immodest and mixed bathing. Well, there's a term for you. Mixed bathing meat, well, never mind. I better explain that. Mixed bathing means boys and girls improperly dressed swimming together that are not brothers and sisters. That's an old term for that. Are we having fun yet? 
Good. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, that's not my thing. I'm just saying today, let's decide we're not going to be like the party crowd. We want to please God. We want to hear from God. We want God to be able to speak to us. We want to be responsive to God. We want to be obedient to God. We want to serve God. So, oh, we can serve. yes, I know I'm supposed to serve God, but I can't this year because we go on vacation. I can't because we got the kids. I can't because this. Well, let's keep our hearts to- soft toward God and open to God. God here is saying, God's teaching us. He says, the burden of the valley of vision. In other words, the burden, the judgment against his city. The place where he's going to reign, his people. Why? Because they just had a party attitude. They did not want to listen to God. They ignored God's commands. They ignored God's instructions just to go ahead and party. And God says, that's, that's something I have to deal with. Again, God tells us this so we can avoid this. So we can be all that God wants us to be so that he can bless and so he can help. So we find the burden of a callous people. The judgment on a callous people just couldn't hear from God. The message was there. Their answer was just party. Their answer was, not going to do it. The answer was, we're not going to weep. We're going to party. We're not going to repent. We're going to go ahead and party. We're not going to go ahead and and seek God's face and seek God's repentance. We're not going to seek getting right with God. We're going to go ahead just like we're doing, only even more so. Very quickly, notice the breaking of a contemptuous politician. So as God's dealing with his people, the breaking of a contemptuous politician. So God begins to deal. He goes from dealing with the entire city. Now he begins to deal with just one. You say, why just one? Because it's typical of people of authority of that time and this time. People of authority of that time and this time. And so we find he begins to we show the breaking of contemptuous politician. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Go get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house and say, so he's pointing out this politician. He's pointing out this treasurer. He's pointing out this ruler uh, in the in the in the area. This treasurer, this one who's in a place of position of authority in the government. He said, "I want you to go tell him he's, this idea. This treasurer, that's a contemptible sound to it. It's got to, this guy. You go tell that guy. You tell this treasurer." Verse sixteen. What does he want him to tell him? What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here? That thou hast hewn thee out a sepulcher here, as he that heweth out a sepulcher on high, and hath graven a habitation for himself in a rock. See, preacher, what's he talking about? He's in the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, the city of kings, where only kings really were buried. Only the influential people were buried. And here we've got a treasurer who was not apparently even necessarily a Jew, but he was there, and he says, who are you? That's what he basically says. What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here? He's saying, who are you? He says, you have have gone ahead and found yourself the biggest sepulcher, making yourself the biggest graveyard, making yourself the biggest tomb. He said, this is where kings are supposed to be buried. This is where the rulers are supposed to be buried. He said, who are you? Why do you think you should have this big sepulcher? Why do you think you should have this big place? Why should you have this big honor? Who are you? What family do you have here that makes you this way? You say, preacher, what's he talking about? I'll tell you, he's talking about dealing with pride. With pride. We're not sure of what crimes this treasurer may have done, but we know, do know his crime was one of pride. God was saying, who do you think you are? Who's your family? Who do you think you are? You can go ahead and build this big sepulcher. Who do you think you are? You can have this big funeral home, if you will. Who do you think you are doing this? He had an idea of pride. Taking a place where he did not belong. Taking a place that was not for him. Taking a place to magnify himself. Boy, if that doesn't sound like politics today, amen? This is politicians. He says, boy, we are somebody. You are nothing. We are somebody. And God says to him, he says, who are you? This treasurer, just the fact that he tells us he's the treasurer, just the fact that he's coming bringing judgment on this treasurer, tells me he may have been a little bit like Judas and just taken some money from the people. And he said, who are you? Who are you? So God is dealing with him with pride. Let me help him. Let me help me. God hates pride. Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Wow. 
It's an abomination. God hates pride. How many here have ever had to deal with pride in your life? The rest of you are too proud to raise your hand. I know, that's right. And we all deal with pride. But in fact, the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. Well, I'm mad at that person. Why? They hurt my feelings. Sounds like pride to me. Well, they didn't treat me right. Sounds like pride to me. Well, they forgot this. They... Sounds like pride to me. We all deal with pride. Here God deals with this pride. He said, who do you think you are? Why do you think you've all got yourself a big sepulcher here? Why you got your place of judgment? He said, why are you doing that? God's dealing with his pride. So as we think of the burden, the judgment on his city, he said, I'm dealing with some folks who do not want to listen. I'm dealing with folks who all they want to do is party. They're... <laughs> He said, you're about to die. The enemy is going to come in and wipe out your city. And all you want to do is party? He said, I'm asking you to repent so maybe we can avoid this judgment. He said, if you repent, if you come back, he said, I, we may be able to stop this whole trouble that's coming. But he said, no, we're just going to party. And not only that, he says, but your politics. He says, a typical person is dealing with pride in your government. This pride. By the way, pride, that's Satan's big sin. Satan's big sin was pride. The Bible tells us about Satan. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which is weak in the nations? For thou hast said, this is what Satan said, this is what got him thrown out of heaven. Thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He said, I'm going to be like God. He's not going to tell me. I'm equal with God. He's not going to dictate to me. I'm going to be equal with God. I want His spot. I want His throne. I want His power. Ladies and gentlemen, every time we tell God, I don't want to hear from you, all I'm going to do is party, we're saying, I'm God. Every time we read God's instructions, we say, no, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it my way. We're saying, I'm God. It's that pride. The answer to that, to Satan at that point, he says, Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So, God's dealing with his people about pride. We all have pride. We all must die to self. We all struggle with that. Trying to get into places we ought not. Trying to make sure that we're exalted. Make sure God's just trying to deal with that. See, preacher, are you mad? At no, I'm not mad. I'm just saying God's trying to tell us, his city, his people, watch out for pride. He's telling his city, his people, his church, he says, watch out. He says that you listen to me and you don't just have this party attitude, this party spirit, that you're going to do what you want and not listen and not let me help you with that. So he's dealing with pride. In fact, in this particular pride, it was... Self-promotion. Self-promotion. You know, it's absurd to have self-promotion. That's the epitome of, of pride. Notice what it says. Verse 16. And what hast thou here? And whom hast thou here that thou hast hewn out thee out of sepulcher here? As he heweth out a sepulcher on high. And graveth an habitation of her for himself in a rock. He said, you made your own sepulcher. He made your own fancy graveyard. You made your own fancy place. And you grave out a great habitation for yourself in a rock. You've really made it up big and proper. He's probably got his name already put there. He's probably got all the statues. Got a long list of all the things he did in his life. You know what I'm saying? He said, you've got this. You're trying to magnify yourself. You're trying to lift yourself up. Not that the people were going to do that. He says, you've done this for yourself. Well, how easy it is for us to promote ourselves. Proverbs 20, verse number 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. How good's brother so-and-so? I don't know, go ask him, he'll tell you. That's what he's saying. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Proverbs 25, 27. It is not good to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory, listen, for men to search their own glory. In other words, I want to make sure I get recognized. I want to make sure people pat me on the back. I want to make sure everybody thinks well of me. For men to search their own glory is not glory. In other words, if I glory, if I promote myself so that you glory me, God says that's no glory. If you do it yourself, there's no glory. If you stir it up yourself, there's no glory. If you get people to say those things about you, there's no glory. Proverbs 25, 6. 
Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king. And stand not in the place of great men. He says, when you go to parties and when you go to a place, he says, don't try to stand with the king. Don't put yourself in the place of great men. For it is better that it be said unto thee, come up hither, that thou should be put, then thou should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. He says, when you go to a place, he says, don't look for the highest, most important seats. He says, because you'll be ashamed when he says, pardon me, that's for somebody important. You get a table by the kitchen. He said, it's better you take the table by the kitchen and have the prince or the king come say, what are you sitting here? Come sit at my table. He said, that's glory. That's praise. But the self-promotion is absurd. In fact, Jesus said, listen, in John 8, 54, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, this is God. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. He goes on to say, but my Father honoreth me. God dealing with his city, his people, he says, well, watch out for pride. Watch out for the pride. Watch out for this promoting of yourself. Oh, we don't have the time, but if you have the time, if you haven't looked at it in a long time, go ahead and look at the book of Esther. And Haman, there's a man who had some pride. Oh, my. Remember the story? He came in one night and he was so proud of himself and he wanted everybody to bow down to him. And the king said, hey, Haman, I'm glad you're here. Because the king had read in the book about how, how, how another fellow had come and had saved his life before. And he says, hey, he said, have we, ever, have, we ever, have we ever helped Mordecai? Mordecai was the one who saved me that day. Did we ever do anything for him? He says, no, we never did anything for him. He saved my life and we didn't do anything for him. No. He said, well, we need to honor him. About that time, it was the middle of the night, Haman came in and the king said, oh, I'm glad you're here. If I really want to honor somebody, if I really want to glorify somebody, what should I do? And the Bible says Haman thought to himself, who else could he be talking about but me? Who else would he want to glorify but me? Who else would he want to honor but me? And so he told him, he said, this is what you need to do. Boy, you need to give him your clothes, give him your chariot, give him your things, and, and have him go through the streets and have somebody in front say, here's the great man, here's the great man, here's the wonderful man. He said, that's, that's, what, that's what you should do to honor whoever it is you're talking about. The Bible said. We know that we know the issue. Haman and Mordecai. Haman hated Mordecai because Mordecai would not even stand up for him because Mordecai wasn't humbling himself before him. And so he says, "Good." He said, "Go get Mordecai and do that to him." Can you imagine Haman having to do that? By the way, God knows how to humble us. Have you figured it out? God knows how to humble us. Full of self, self-promotion. God says, no. The breaking of a contemptuous politician, the wickedness of pride, the absurdity of self-promotion. God knows how to humble the pride, the proud. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. First Peter 5, likewise ye younger submit unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud. See, when we're proud and we're trying to do things in our own pride and our own strength and promote ourselves, God resists us. But it says, and giveth grace to the humble. Notice how God deals with this pride as he will deal with our pride. Verse 17. Verse 16, he says, what have you here? He said, who are you? Who's your family? Why do you think you get to build that sepulcher? He says, why is that? Verse 17, behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. He says, you think you're going to be buried in that sepulcher you made? He says, no, I'm taking you out and I'm going to bury you somewhere else. Verse 18, he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball <laughs> into a large country and there thou shalt die. He says, you think you're really something? He says, watch this. He said, I'm going to take you like a rubber ball, like a little baseball, and I'm going to throw you as far as I can into a far country, and there's where you're going to die. How many have figured out God's really in control? Let's don't be prideful. Let's don't argue against God. Let's don't promote ourselves. Let God do the promoting and let God do the protecting. And so he said, I'm going to do that. And he goes on. Verse 19, and I will drive thee from thy station. He said, I'm, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your place in the city. And from thy state, 
Shall he pull thee down? Wow. He said, I'm going to bury you. I'm going to toss you. I'm going to drive you. I'm going to pull you down. Let's check pride in our hearts. So as God's dealing with his people, again to bring repentance, again to bring joy, again to have him walk with God. Lastly, we see the bringing of a choice paladin. The bringing of a choice paladin. The word paladin there simply means champion for a cause. A champion for a cause. God brings in a champion. How much they understood, I don't know. But we're going to see, and we'll be done in just a moment, we're going to see who this champion is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. But they, at this time, they didn't have the full revelation of the book that we have. But he brings in his choice pavilion, his, uh, paladin. He brings in this champion over a cause. So as he brings out the... See, God knows how to humble the proud, and he knows how to elevate the humble. Look at verse number 20. And it shall come to pass in that day... Looking ahead to that judgment day, looking ahead, that I shall call my servant Elikim, the son of Helikiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, he shall shut, and none shall open, and I shall fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house." And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagons. He said, I'm going to take you, you prideful guy, you treasure that's crooked, you treasure that I'm going to, he said, I'm putting you out. He said, but I'm going to replace you. I'm going to bring in this champion. I'm going to bring in this champion of a cause. God can humble the proud and promote the humble. That's why the Bible says in James 4.10, Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. He says, so I'm bringing in this new guy. Down the road, I'm bringing in this new guy, Elikim. And he's going to be the one who's going to have glory. He's going to take your space. He's going to rule the government. And the key of the house of David, notice what it says, will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and shall shut, and none shall open. See, who could it be talking about? I think it's in your notes, Revelation 3, 7. And, the angel, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, talking about Jesus Christ. He that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Here we have a man that he's going to replace him, but also alluding to the fact that Jesus Christ, the real king, the real champion, the real throne of David will come. Aren't you glad God knows Jesus was coming? Aren't you glad God had that plan? As he spoke to them, he said, yes, and I'm pulling out the pride and I'm bringing in humble. He said, I'm promoting this one and I'm giving him the key of David, the throne of David, and he's going to rule. Boy, I'm glad. What else can this be a picture of but the picture of God usurping the authority, if you will, of Satan, who's the prince of this world, and bringing up the king of kings. See, the prince of this world, Satan's the prince of this world now, but the king is coming. Glory, hallelujah. And he's going to set that prince on his ear. He's going to take care of things there. But here we find alluding to this one who's going to come, but also alluding to the fact that Jesus is that paladin. He is that champion. He is that one that's coming. God doesn't use words in the Bible, just what a coincidence. No, no, God was showing us that he is the true one. So what are you talking about? It's Jesus, the one who's ruling, who's ruling. He said, I'll give him the government. By the way, I'm glad Jesus is ruling and will rule. Boy, that in Jerusalem, again, we talk about in the millennial reign, we come back after the battle of Armageddon, he's going to rule with a rod of iron from Jerusalem for a thousand years. What a time that will be. Oh, I tell you what, there'll be no conditional use permits for bars in those days. Oh, no cannabis clubs in those days. Amen. They say, well, we, want to, we want to open a strip club. Ah, oh, what a time that will be when he rules from Jerusalem. So he rules. The government is in his hand. The key of David, talking about the throne of David, that God promised the Messiah to come and the, rule, the, reign, the throne of David would reign forever. He's ruling. He's risen. This paladin, this one who's going to replace him in that day, in that last day coming. He's risen. In fact, the name Elikim means, if you look it up in the, in the Hebrew, God of raising. God of raising. 
Oh, I'm glad he rose from the dead. Ain't you, aren't you? He rose from the dead. So he's ruling. He's risen. We see in Revelation 3, 7, he's righteous. He's the holy. He's the true. And he is reliable. Reliable. He said this, this other judge, this other treasure, he says, he was crooked. He was pride. And I'm throwing him out. He said, but I'm raising up one. Well, let's look how God described it. Verse 23. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagon. He is reliable. By the way, Jesus Christ is the epitome of security. He's the epitome of reliability. He is that nail in a sure place. Now, if you've lived in California all your life, if you've lived in the Bay Area all your life, you may not understand. How many have ever in your house hung up your coats always on a nail? So you know what I'm talking about. You don't have a nice closet, you got a nail hanging there. I need somewhere to hang my coat. Right there. I need a place to hang my pots. Right there. He's a nail in a sure place. And all glory, all offspring, all vessels be hung there. I'm glad he is that nail in a sure place that we can hang everything on. I can hang my joy on him. I can hang my hope on him. I can hang my trust on him. I can hang my life on him. I can hang my hope on him. I can hang my peace on him. I can hang my future on him. I'm glad he's that one. I can hang all those things on. Even in the judgment, the burden of Jerusalem, he says, ah, but I got somebody coming. I got somebody coming. So I'm going to get rid of the crook. But I'm raising up the just one. The holy one. So preacher, what's the, what's the message in this? Number one, let's just trust Christ. The nail in a sure place. Let's just trust God. For everything in our life. Listen to Him. When we read, God is speaking to us. Don't say, well, that's neat, but I'm going to party. I'm going to do what I want. No, God wants to walk with us and help us and bless us. Let's trust Him. Let's keep an active, responsive conscience toward God. Let's check pride in our own life. If God, if God looked at your life today, would He see somebody who's full of pride? Would He say, who do you think you are? Why do you think you can do that? What's that old thing? You want to make God laugh, as they say? Make some plans. Without Him. And then let's rejoice in that sure, that nail in a sure place. Isaiah says, Oh, he says, my heart's for you, people. Come back to God. I preached to myself this morning. I have to be careful I'm listening to God in everything. I've got to be careful about pride in my life. I have to be careful about my own assumptions. His city. His people. He wants us back. He wants us back. If you died this morning, are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? Jesus died for you so you can know that. Not so you can hope that, so you can know that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all rotten sinners. Every single one of us. The wages of sin is death, a place called hell. But God committed his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that means just admit he is God like he said he was, and believe in thy heart that God is raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. At age 19, I recognized who I was and who he was and where I was headed, but he'd already paid the price, and I called upon him and he saved me. Certainly not been perfect ever since, but boy, I've been saved ever since. And I have that hope because he's that nail in a sure place. Are you saved today? I hope you are. If not, you can be. In a moment, we'll have an invitation. We invite folks to come. We'll have a man with a man, a lady with a lady. Take the word of God and show you from the Bible how to know for sure you're on your way to heaven. That's the most important thing in the world. God loves you and wants you saved. It's not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God doesn't take glory to anybody going to hell. He wants all to be with him, but he gives us the choice. He paid the price, offers the gift. Then as God's people, 
in Jerusalem. Let's listen. Let's heed. Let's obey. Let's trust in Him. I've got it all figured out. I got my health, got my money, got my schedule, got my calendar. I'm all set. I don't need Him. Oh. Yes, we do. Let's trust Him. Well, I got all my defenses. Defenses are nothing without God. I've got my plans. Plans are nothing without God. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads, please.